Well, thank you very much, uh, Avi. Uh, I know it's, it's very unusual maybe for this seminar to have a talk about uh, infinite sets and uh, um, axiomatics of set theory and so on. So please feel free. And, and there will be a lot of um, controversial statements here. It, it, will, it will be semi-mathematical and semi, uh, how should I say, political talk. So uh, uh, please feel free to, uh, to object or to, if there will be a lovely fight here. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going to, to enjoy it. But uh, if, if, if you don't understand any of the terms I use, please please ask. I'm not sure I'll be able to get you all the technicalities, but uh, still, I hope uh, you get a feeling of what's, uh, what's going on. Okay, continuum problem was the center problem of set theory from its uh, inception. And um, um, the question that uh, Cantor, the founder of set theory, uh, phrased in uh, 1878, actually the version of the, of the question appeared before that, was uh, you talk about uh, sets of reals, the real numbers. Uh, he proved that the real numbers, you definitely got countable sets of real numbers, uh, that the reals are not, are not countable. In some very strong sense, the reals are, it's a larger set than the, um, than the integers. Uh, though you got sets which are much larger than the integers, like the rationals, the um, algebraic numbers and so on, which are uh, countable, but the reals are not countable. And the question is, um, is that are two possibilities for a set of reals? A set of reals, basically you have, uh, let's say, R, you have N, the natural numbers. Is there anything um, in between? And um, his conjecture was that that's, um, um, uh, that's the case. Uh, and uh, he phrased what he called the weak continuum hypothesis. In a minute I'll say why it's called the weak continuum hypothesis. It says that every infinite set of reals is either countable or equinumerous with the um, uh, all real line. By the way, when I say countable, I include finite. Uh, countable is either countably infinite or, or finite. So, so basically, uh, are you talking about real dichotomy as far as um, 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 sets of reals? Uh, a little bit later, uh, um, um, Cantor developed the theory of cardinals. And uh, we're talking that there is a kind of um, um, well-ordered structure of cardinals where Aleph 0, using the, the Hebrew letter Aleph, Aleph 0 is the uh, first uncountable cardinal, the cardinality of the uh, uh, natural numbers. But then you can form an hierarchy in which you can go to the next cardinal, next cardinal, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, when you exhausted all the Aleph Ns, you, you reach something called Aleph Omega and, uh, and so on. So really, the, the, um, um, the statement, uh, the real continuum hypothesis, or the full continuum hypothesis, it says that uh, the real numbers are exactly, uh, exactly this, this cardinal, exactly Aleph 1, the, the very next cardinal after Aleph 0. The reason that that's not exactly the same statement, that uh, uh, there is no intermediate set, because it requires um, um, something, something else. It requires the fact that every two sets can be compared as far as the cardinality. And that by itself is not uh, um, uh, an, obvious, uh, an obvious thing, and that requires um, something that you, I'm sure, heard about, the axiom of choice. Uh, so it's only under the axiom of choice that the two statements are, uh, um, are equivalent, but, um, uh, but both of them are meaningful, um, uh, meaningful question. Because, for instance, this one, Aleph 1, is a cardinal that automatically can be well ordered. Uh, that's by its definition. I will not get to the technical definition. So the fact that it has the same cardinality like the reals, uh, 2 to the 0, of course, is the cardinality of the, uh, um, where do you get the, the pointer? Uh, oh. Is there a? Hmm? You want the laser pointer? Laser pointer, yeah. Oh, there must be. Maybe this one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so it says that the continuum is, um, uh, can be well-ordered, and it's the, the very, the very um, the next cardinal. He also conjectures that for every alpha. Sorry? He also conjectures that for every alpha. Yeah, yeah. He, he conjectured what he called the generalized continuum hypothesis, namely that for every uh, alpha, alpha alpha is equal to, to, the, next, to the next cardinal. <coughs> that for every. Uh, by the way, there, is, there exists also the weak version, namely that there is nothing between, that for every set A, uh, the, there is nothing between uh, the, the, the A and the power set of A. That there is nothing in between, that every subset is either uh, less or equal than this one or, or, or this one. 
Uh, by the way, but that's, that's a, in this case, for the generalized continuum of positives, it's, it's equivalent. It, it does imply the axiom of choice, the, the generalized, this version of the generalized continuum hypothesis. Okay, now uh, um, that's equivalent to the following, uh, the following statement that, uh, um, that if you, at least under the axiom of choice, that if you have a function from the reals into an ordinal, ordinal is something that represents a well-ordered set, then uh, the cardinality of that ordinal is at most alpha one. You cannot map the reals onto, onto the second um, cardinal here. So that's the continuum hypothesis. Cantor spent uh, most of his, the rest of his life trying to prove it. It may cause this uh, nervous breakdown, down, um, and uh, it become a very central uh, and very annoying, uh, uh, very annoying problem. Uh, it was um, go back for a minute uh, in the famous list of problems of Hilbert uh, uh, from the uh, Paris um, Mathematical Co um, Congress of uh, 1900. That was the first. The continuum hypothesis was the first problem actually on the, um, on the list of problems of, uh, of Hilbert. Uh, as pro probably all of you know, the problem turned out to be unsolvable on the basis of the, of the accepted axioms of, uh, of set theory. To use the terminology of Erdes, uh, it's the monster of independence. Erdes used to talk about uh, whenever a um, uh, problem he was working on um, turned out to be independent, and uh, there were many, uh, you would say the, mon the ugly monster of independence raises its head again, and they're very frustrated by, uh, 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 by that fact. So anyway, the continuum hypothesis turned out to be uh, another case of the um, uh, action of the monster of independence. Uh, Gedel, in 1938, here in Princeton, proved that the continuum hypothesis is consistent with the axioms of set theory. You cannot disprove it. Um, uh, you cannot disprove the continuum hypothesis. Uh, Paul Coy in 1963 um, proved that the continuum hypothesis is independent. You cannot, uh, you cannot prove it. Um, okay, uh, technically there is always um, an assumption that set theory is consistent. Uh, as you may know, it's not, it's something that you can't prove the consistency of, I think it's one of the Gödel's incompleteness theorem from uh, 1931. Okay, so th the problem is independent. Now the fact that there is an independent problem uh, in, the, in the theory, it should not be too surprising because there is the Gödel incompleteness theorem, which tells us that any um, theory, any mathematical theory which we work with, or reasonable theory, just to, to, to be at least um, uh, strong enough to, to get some of the basic facts about arithmetic, any such, such theory contains a statement which, is, uh, which the theory does not decide. Uh, but so, so the fact that there are independent problems, problems that are not settled by the, by the axioms, is not. Um, is not surprising by itself. What was surprising is the fact that uh, such central problem of the field, something which is um, the most important problem of the field, turned out to be um, um, independent. And that was quite um, uh, that was quite a shock. Uh, now it's worse than that. The <coughs> independence turned out to be that if you talk about the, for instance, the, the um, what, what, what is the difference between the cardinality of the natural numbers and the cardinality of the reals? Actually, there is very little that the axiom really tell you. You can have, as far as the axioms of set theory are concerned, you've got many, many different possibilities, and all of them are consistent with the axioms. So if you like, you can have uh, that uh, the continuum, uh, the, the, set of the, uh, the size of the reals is, uh, sorry, that you can have uh, 2 to the 0 equal uh, aleph 2, you can have it uh, equal to aleph 17, uh, it, it cannot be, there is one small limitation that it cannot be uh, Aleph Omega, it cannot be the first cardinal after these cardinals, but it could be the very next one. It could be uh, Aleph Omega plus one. It could be, again, I'm now getting technical, Aleph Omega one, namely that it's the first cardinal having uncountably many cardinals um, uh, uh, below it. So uh, almost everything, um, uh, almost everything goes. And almost everything is consistent with the um, uh, with the axioms of set theory. Now, it was worse than that. It's not just that the continuum policies turn out to be independent. Once the, the wonderful method invented by Cohen forcing, uh, you could show that many, many different problems are uh, independent of the axiom. Problems that uh, mathematicians in different fields were looking at turned out to be, um, uh, to be independent. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, another um, 
interesting example is the, um, the white problem from uh, abelian groups theory, uh, which was proved by Shellach uh, to be um, uh, uh, to be independent. Uh, if you want a topological group statement of the problem, uh, the, um, the dual by Pontryagin duality, the problem is really uh, suppose you have an abelian to topological abelian group which is compact and uh, uh, pathwise connected. An example is the the circle, of course, is a uh, compact uh, pathwise connected topological group. If you take product of the um, uh, as many copies as you like of the of the circle. That's again compact, uh, pathwise connected uh, topological group, but abelian topological group. The question is: Is that all? Is every compact, uh, pathwise connected topological group it copies product of copies of the uh, um, of the circle? That's independent. This is exactly what the Shellach uh, uh, argument shows. Namely, you can't on, on the basis of the axiom set theory. If you like, you can assume that that's uh, um, that it is true. If you, if you like, you, you can assume that that's false. So that, that was rather a um, uh, shocking example. To the proof you're yeah, no, the, 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 proof, uh, well, the proof can be, well, it's not completely, uh, it's not forcing free, but you, you can uh, kind of hide or, or um, delegate the, the, the forcing part to, um, um, to some kind of black box. Uh, really what, what uh, the Shellach proof uh, proved was that um, there is a canonical model that uh, Gödel introduced, L, constructible universe. We'll say something about it maybe later. Uh, and uh, and that was the model in which Gödel uses to show that the continuum hypothesis, generous continuum hypothesis, is consistent. Now, in that model, the Whitehead conjecture is true. That was done by uh, that was Shellach proved. So it is uh, the Whitehead conjecture is true in the in Gödel's um, universe. Uh, it's um, on the other end, uh, if you want a model in which it is false. If you use um, um, uh, Martin axiom, which will I'll say something about uh, about later, which is a kind of general axiom with some motivation that I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, toward the end of my talk, but um, uh, Martin axiom, uh, which is so, so once you have got the black box and tells you this axiom is consistent, this uh, the Martin axiom implies that. Uh, um, uh, I, I, actually, to tell you an historical thing, uh, Shellach, who's done wonderful work about forcing at that stage, I knew him, of course, very well. He was a uh, friend and uh, uh, we were students together. Uh, he didn't, um, uh, at that point, it, he really, when he proved it, he knew very little about forcing, really. So he was using both you know, the, the constructible universe L and the um, um, Martin axiom as a black, black box. You really got into forcing and invented uh, things which turned out to be very useful, things like proper forcing and so on. Uh, that was done because he was trying to settle, you see, Martin axiom implies the continuum policy is false. So you've got this, the situation is uh, um, that uh, uh, L, V equal L implies GCH plus, of course, white conjecture is true. Martin axiom implies, as we'll see, GCH is false and white uh, so the question he was trying to settle is negation of Whitehead consistent with, with the generalized continuum hypothesis. And for that, he needed to get very deep into forcing, and that's why uh, he really started uh, learning for forcing, and it's, to, to a large extent uh, uh, made a rather uh, deep transformation of the field. OK, but anyway, uh, some of the shock of this independence. I'll, I'll give you two quotes of many, many passages uh, about um, that it really shakes the, the claim of set theory to be to play a central role in the foundation of mathematics. For instance, Mostovsky, 1967. Uh, such results show that axiomatic set theory is hopelessly incomplete. If, uh, if there are a multitude of set theories, uh, you've got all kinds of combination about you know, what the size of the continuum and whether this conjecture is true, that conjecture is true. And, and it's not as all these uh, problems are independent, but also many of them are mutually independent. You could have uh, all kinds of combinations of uh, continuum is this size, and uh, uh, the thing about white conjecture is this, the, the truth of white con conjecture, and the truth of something else is, is that. And you can have many different uh, uh, combinations. So a uh, kind of uh, uh, um, really a jungle of, of possible set theorists, uh, then none of them can claim the central place in, in mathematics. Uh, you can't... Uh, but somehow, maybe luckily, it, it kind of turned out that a lot of, uh, a lot of mathematics does not care. Uh, the issue is, um, uh, it's true, 
but uh, but uh, you know sociologically and historically that's uh, um, that's true. The problem is is that going to stay to stay in forever? I mean, definitely more and more problems turn out to be, and uh, I'll, I'll try to to think about that for, for you know whether whether that will stay will stay in forever. Or maybe simply you simply didn't run into yet into the uh, problem problems of independence. And uh, okay, uh, Diodonet, for instance, uh, behind classical analysis, there is infinity of different mathematics. Mathematics in the plural, namely that the different possible mathematics, and for time being, no definitive uh, reason to compel us to choose one rather than another. You see, it's, it's very different. Uh, of course, if you think about, for instance, groups, you've got all different kinds of groups abelian groups, non abelian groups, simple groups, non simple groups, um, uh, etc. So you're, you're used to the fact that there are cre mathematical creatures of, of different size. But here you're talking about your framework in which you work. There are different uh, you know, rules of the game. It's, it's as if almost you have a, um, um, a country with. Uh, Many different constitutions at the same time, conflicting constitution. It's it's uh, it's not just the fact that you got the diversity in the country of different different kinds of people, but you got uh, the, the different rules of the game, uh, which is very very annoying and very very frustrating. So what uh, uh, what is the meaning of that? What what do, what do you do about it? Well, one way of doing it is say, okay, that means that all these problems are um, you know, independent problems are really meaningless. Uh, it's a formal game. Choose whatever whatever rules of the game you like. Uh, it has no meaning for you know anything you, uh, uh, you do. You know uh, you make you make a, um, a random um, uh, a random choice. Uh, I once talked to to Erdes about it, and uh, Erdes said that uh, when he will meet uh, will meet God, uh, if you know his term for the SF. The, I hope I'm not in, insulting anybody. Your religious sensitivity is the supreme fascist. That was the his term for God. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, when, when, when we go, I'll ask him, you know, about the continuum policy. Is it true or not? And then he was speculating what the possible uh, answer would be. So um, uh, one answer would be, uh, God will tell him, well, the continuum is true, false, and give him the reason. Another possibility, God will tell him, uh, this is the answer, but it, you cannot understand why this is true. Another possibility is that uh, it's not, um, it's, it's completely meaningless. It's a formal game, and... Uh, um, and I don't, uh, I don't care. So he was speculating about possible, uh, possible uh, results. And I don't know what, what happened to him now. But <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, so uh, uh, so definitely you can you can say that the problem is completely, completely mean, uh, all these problems which turn out to be independent, completely meaningless, and uh, uh, there is no uh, one answer which is better than than another. Gödel, for instance, has got very deep conviction that that's not the case. For instance, in his paper of 1947, he writes, uh, the paper was republished in uh, 1963, right, uh, Juliet? Cantor's conjecture might be either true or false, and its indecibility for the axiom can only mean that this axiom do not contain a complete description of this reality. And such belief is by no, mere, uh, by no means chimerical, since it's possible to point ways in which a decision of the question might be nevertheless be obtained. Namely, uh, Geddes' conception was that there is some real, a true answer. Uh, it should be either true or false in some, um, I don't know, metaphysical uh, or physical or I don't know what sense. And uh, uh, the, the, the fact that, that um, uh, you cannot decide it on the basis of the axiom, simply the axiom do not exhaust everything that should be true about this uh, uh, universe of um, um, of sets, and if you are able to find the right, the right axiom, the, the, the thing will be, will be settled. Now, let me say something from the beginning. I'm not going to talk about what's really true, uh, because that, that runs into a very difficult, uh, which I'm not sure exactly what my position is about, ontological of metaphysical, uh, what, is, what is really true. I'll, 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 st I'll st try to stay on some more pragmatic, uh, uh, more pragmatic level. Uh, so, okay, so, so Gettles, if, if you follow Gettles' uh, uh, thing, you say, okay, if, if we are um, not ready to live with uh, s such a multitude of different, uh, different set theory, we want to, s to decide what are the rules of the game. So we have to, set, we have to expand the axioms. We have to, to, to expand the axioms to make decisions about all these independent, uh, independent problems. Now, um, uh, of course, you can make a decision. You, you can decide the continuum policy because both the continuum policy and its negation are consistent. That means you can choose to be true or to be false. You can edit this an axiom. But that's too, uh, too ad hoc and too arbitrary. So when you look for new axioms, you try, you try to, to uh, the axioms will satisfy some, uh, um, some requirements. 
Now, for instance, the axioms should be strong enough to decide the large class of statements which are undecidable on the basis of the accepted axioms. You can't decide all questions because of Gödel incompleteness theorem. Suppose you, had, you expand your axiom system, there will be an independent, uh, independent problem. But you, you try to uh, something that, uh, that a relatively large uh, class of statements is decided. Taking, for instance, the continuum hypothesis by itself, let's say adopted as an axiom, that uh, doesn't satisfy exactly this, uh, uh, this requirement because, because there are so many things which are um, independent, if, even if you assume CH or assume the negation of CH. For instance, if you assume C, uh, continuum hypothesis is false, what is the value of the continuum? Um, there are so many things which are still in, in the same domain which are still independent. So you try to look for something which is more... Yeah. Uh, you don't lose as far as independence, but 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 maybe it depends on what type what type of mathematics you get, and you do get some results. And the issue is that, that result that you like or don't like, um, and so on. And I'll say something about it later. Yeah. That what? That. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, because he was, he was eager to solve problems. So if, you, if that helps you to solve the problem, fine. But, but uh, uh, okay, now the axiom should produce a coherent, elegant theory. Uh, now comes the, the very vague term of elegant or beauty, beautiful theory. And the question is, does, does it give you an elegant, um, elegant theory? And uh, for instance, uh, take the uh, Gödel's universe. Suppose you assume that the universe is Gödel's. Gödel's universe. Let's decide the continuum hypothesis, the generalized continuum hypothesis. It decides many different, um, um, many different statements. Um, it's a relatively, uh, reasonably complete, complete theory. But uh, um, for instance, is that uh, uh, give you an elegant theory? Well, in some sense, it does not, because if, if you assume the, the um, uh, constructible uh, axiom of constructibility, Gödel's the universe is Gödel's universe. Then, in some sense, um, sometimes um, I heard the term used that um, L is the the, um, uh, the paradise of counterexamples. Namely, if you try to prove some kind, uh, usually when, when you try to you have a problem, you have the, the more elegant solution. If you think about the two possibilities, there is a more elegant uh, side and there is the one which is less elegant. It's very rare that both uh, answers to the problem would be uh, as um, um, pleasing or as desirable. So. Uh, Sorry? Uh, not exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but 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 uh, uh, not exactly because L, for instance, does satisfy the first one. It, it decides the large class of statement, but usually it's uh, everything you try. There is there is a counterexample. But one of the very few examples that that it's give the more elegant direction is the Whitehead conjecture. The Whitehead conjecture, uh, you know, for, for the groups, it is the more elegant uh, solution. And for a change, L gives you the more elegant direction. But in most cases, it gives you the, the, um, um, uh, the counterexample. OK, so uh, now the axiom should have some intuitive or philosophical, uh, philosophical appeal. I, I sometimes call it the, um, the axiom, or the axioms should have a, a good slogan, a good propaganda that you can make for it. And uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not joking. I mean, that, that uh, it's something that, uh, that fits a certain intuition that uh, uh, you, rather, um, um, you rather like it. OK, now if possible, and I'll say about that uh, in a minute, I'll say something about it, should have a testable, verifiable consequence, something that, that you like the consequence, there's some reason why, why you like the, the consequence of the, of the axiom. Uh, that I'll say something about even testable in a, in a physical sense, uh, which is uh, a very wide speculation. Now, the last one is a little bit more technical. You know, the standard way in which you um, 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 decide, uh, in which you show independence is by forcing. You start from a universe of set theory, you do a forcing construction of coin, and you get a universe which, uh, which uh, its properties are different, satisfy different things. Now, the best if you can have that the axiom is resilient under forcing extensions, namely, that if you do forcing, that if you have the axioms, you don't, you don't lose it anymore by, by forcing. For instance, consider Gödel's um, um, V equal L statement. V equal L is very, is very non-resilient. Namely, it's very easy to do any kind of forcing construction would kill the fact that, that the universe is Gödel's universe. But on the other hand, once you, it's not Gödel's universe, that's 
uh, that's it. It's, it's almost like uh, trying to take, uh, and uh, we'll go back to this analogy, uh, algebraic closure of a field. Once, once you've got a solution for, uh, uh, for equation, the solution is there. I mean, if you make further extension of the field, you don't lose the, the, um, that solution uh, in a minute. But uh, uh, so if possible, you would like it to be as, as resilient under forcing strength as possible. Uh, that's uh, um, that's true to a large extent. That's true to a large extent. That uh, the third one is the one that, that really talks whether there are some philosophical or, or some motivation that you can give for wh wh why do you want to adopt adopt the axiom. So basically, the the, uh, the other four um, items here are more to do with the consequences of the axioms rather than the intrinsic uh, value of the of the axiom. And in some sense, Gödel was saying that that's, that should be a main a main criteria. I'll, I'll, uh, um, I'll, uh, uh, I'll give you a quote from, from Gödel that uh, um, even disregarding intrinsic necessity of some new axiom, a probable decision about its proof is possible. Um, it didn't mean proof, I guess, but it's adoption. By studying its success. Success here means fruitfulness in consequence. There might exist axioms so abundant in the verifiable consequences, shedding so, my so much light upon a whole field and yielding such powerful methods for solving problems that no matter whether or not they are intrinsically necessary, even without, if you don't have that motivation, still, uh, they would have to be accepted at least in the same sense as any well-established uh, uh, physical theory. You've got something that you uh, give you so much consequence, maybe it, it, it doesn't look, uh, you don't have very initially very good uh, motivation, but if you study the consequences, you, are, uh, you like it. Uh, you like it, it's useful, and so on. Uh, let me say something about um, um, uh, one, one class of axioms which um, uh, turn out in some sense to satisfy many of the, of the requirements, which is strong uh, axioms of um, uh, infinity. Strong axioms of infinity, uh, one of the axioms of set theory, uh, tells you that there is an infinite set. Axiom of infinity. Uh, now, uh, it's really um, the axiom that, um, that makes set theory more um, stronger than number theory. Really, if you drop the, the axiom of infinity, then set theory is bi-interpretable with, uh, uh, with the usual piano, piano axiom. If you replace it by its negation. Though. Sorry? If you replace, replace it by, the, yeah, but without it, it doesn't give you more power than, than uh, um. now, uh, the axiom of infinity says that, uh, so you got a kind of jump from the finite sets to you jump to the infinite sets. Th there is a major, a major jump. Some people say unjustified jump. It's something that uh, we should not be, be uh, taken. If you are definitely, if you are finitist, um, um, that's uh, uh, that's the case. So a strong axiom of infinity, in some sense, says that there are more jumps like like, like that. There are more more jumps that that, that tell you that there are some um, sets which are much larger than than smaller um, um, smaller sets in the all hierarchy of such such axiom. Roughly, um, or most of them, or the stronger ones, at, at the feature, uh, roughly they say that if something happens in the universe of set theory, then uh, uh, really uh, it happened before. They've got some kind of reflection uh, uh, character. Namely, if, uh, if you have a structure uh, with a certain property, then there exists a, sub a small, smaller substructure. The universe of set theory is so large that, that if something happens, it really happened before. That it, that, uh, um, so you got points where, where you start repeating yourself in a way. So uh, that's a very vague uh, way of describing um, uh, strong axioms of infinity. I will not get, maybe you heard about measurable cardinal. There are uh, other notions of uh, um, strongly compact, uh, uh, super compact, and, uh, uh, um, and so on. Uh, you know, uh, just one example of a, uh, um, um, a strong um, um, axiom of infinity. You know that um, uh, Product, of course, Tikhonov theorem, product uh, of, of compact space is, is compact. Now, uh, what about um, Lindelof uh, spaces? You know that uh, Lindelof is, uh, of course, generalizing um, um, compactness. Namely, every cover got countable subcover. Lindelof space do not have, the product doesn't have to be Lindelof. But could you bound the level of Lindelofness of the, um, of the product? Namely, suppose you take a product of Lindelof spaces. Is there a cardinal kappa such that you are sure that every cover 
by sets, it's got a uh, subcover of cardinality less, less than kappa. It's product of an arbitrary number. Uh, arbitrary number, yeah. Could you, could you bound the, the cover, covering that you can, you, uh, you can do it? That's a strong, uh, that's a strong cardinal um, assumption with many, many um, 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 consequences. In fact, there exists something like that. that uh, OK, so um, uh, large cardinal hierarchy. The interesting thing, by the way, that they form an hierarchy, that uh, you try different kinds, and they all uh, 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 turn out to be comparable as far as their uh, uh, it's an excellent of, uh, of axioms that satisfies, I wouldn't say all, maybe I exaggerated here, but uh, many of the requirements of the choice of um, uh, new axioms. Uh, unfortunately, axioms of, uh, of strong infinity uh, do not settle the continuum hypothesis, the problem we started with. There is a kind of general method of Levy and Solovey that shows the continuum hypothesis is independent even if one adds any of the accepted axioms of strong infinity. You can, almost the same freedom you have as far as the size of the continuum is still, um, uh, still true even if you had the existence of the cardinal I was taking about the Lindelof or measurable cardinal or super compact cardinal, whatever the terms are. Uh, it's, it's a very general way of showing that it really doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't settle the problem. The method is on the side of uh, Cohen? Uh, no, it uses forcing. No, it, no, it uses forcing, but it shows that the point is how, how do you do it with preserving the, the, the strong x infinity? Does not uh, disprove and does, does not prove. Yeah, no, so both are. Both, bo both are. Bo both are. Uh, so it really doesn't, uh, that, that, that doesn't settle the continuum. Policy. Let me do a small, uh, a small direction. Um, uh, and, and here I'm, I'm making a very wild, um, uh, very wild speculation. And if you'll, if you'll be. A very powerful consequence could mean that new axioms are mathematical consequences that cannot be derived without them. Uh, even finitary consequence and seems highly unlikely to be falsifiable. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, because of Gödel's theorem, every um, each each strong axiom infinity gets you new arithmetical statements which cannot be proved otherwise. Uh, and I, I'm talking about um, something which is called pi zero one uh, statement. Uh, a pi zero one statement is uh, for in, in arithmetic, for instance, is a statement uh, equivalent by Matiasevich to something that says that a certain polynomial, you got a certain polynomial um, integer coefficients, and it says it doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a root. For every n1, nk, pn1, nk is different than 0. Look, look at the statement, simple statement like that. Each of these strong axioms of infinity introduces, and you can really write the polynomial, that, that uh, the, um, this axiom proves that this polynomial has no, um, 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 no, integer, um, um, no integer roots. But you cannot prove it without, uh, uh, um, without the axiom. So, uh, so there are fine tech consequences. Are they interesting? Did, did it, uh, anyone came up with an example of a polynomial that people have really looked at? Not quite, but uh, to, be, to be quite honest. But, but uh, in principle, that could, uh, uh, that could happen. Uh, as usual, about natural numbers that we believe are not provable. Uh, usually, uh, it's a statement, uh, the Gettel statement is a statement that something is consistent to, uh, 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 with, with ZFC. So now if you look at a, at a, a pi zero one, uh, you look at a pi zero one statement like this, then in some sense it's um, verifiable, it's fal falsifiable. You know, if it's, if it's wrong, then if you keep trying, you know, the, uh, the roots, if there are roots, well, uh, it depends how much time you have to look for it, what the bound for the roots, but you're going to run to them. So, so the, it's, it's falsifiable. And the fact that you didn't find a, uh, a counterexample may mean that probably you want to believe the statement. It's not an argument by itself, but, but, uh, but this is something that, that, uh, uh, that you might say that almost a physical, it, it's almost a physical statement about uh, the universe which, which you cannot prove, which you want to assume it's true, but you don't want to, uh, um, without, without the statement. Let me uh, 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 skip the, the, the next. Uh, uh, um, okay. Uh, is it conceivable different set that you can compare different set theories by uh, fields outside of mathematics? Let's say physics. Is it relevant, uh, for instance, for the physics, what type of set theory your theory is? Now, think if you think, think about physics, you have a certain mathematical structure that describes the Hilbert space, the, 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 the uh, um, uh, manifolds that, um, um, that appears in um, the strings and, uh, and everything. 
So is it possible that, that uh, different set theories will give you implications which are relevant to physics? I don't have an example. There is no, there is no example like that. But uh, the fact that there are things which indicate that it's not completely, um, um, not completely outrageous. Uh, it could be that a certain f uh, scientific theory, if you embed the mathematical structure inside a one set theory, is more simplified. Uh, it prefers one set theory over another. On the, imp the impact could be that uh, one could derive some experimental testable consequence that, uh, um, that you cannot be able to derive uh, from other uh, set theory. Is that completely uh, outrageous? Now, uh, I don't have an example, of course, but uh, let me give you something which touches on the uh, on, the, on that possibility, which uh, a physical example. Now let's take the, the, the famous theorem of um, uh, Koch and Specker that uh, uh, no hidden variables in quantum mechanics. Uh, the Bell theorem and the uh, Koch and Specker theorem. Um, let me, uh, so here is a paper by uh, late Itamar Pitovsky uh, that um, the reason I picked this paper is uh, uh, about the only f a paper in physical review letter that mentioned continuum hypothesis in the paper. Uh, Actually, it mentions uh, Martin axiom, belongs to a family of strands in many parts uh, Martin axiom should appear here somewhere. Yeah, yeah Martin axiom, yeah. Uh, the second phase, uh, validity of uh, strictly. Uh, okay, so let, let, let me very briefly say what, uh, what the story is. Uh, this, um, you know, you've got the spin of a, 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 a particle with spin one, a boson. The spin can be measured along any axis, and possible values would be one, zero, minus one. Uh, now, if you've got orthogonal um, um, a system of orthogonal axis, then you cannot measure simultaneously. You've got the, uh, the corresponding operators do not commute, but the squares do commute, and you can determine the squares of the uh, of the thing, and you know that always uh, uh, the sum of the uh, the squares is true. So just exactly one of the x uh, um, square x y as value one. Uh, two, I'm sorry. The hidden variable assumption claims that the particle carries uh, the hidden variable, the one that uh, it's a few that some predetermined values of these values, which the values is what, what we measure. The caution specter theorem claims that this is impossible. There is no way of to assigning values to the uh, coordinates on the, on the different possible uh, uh, orthogonal systems that will satisfy that the sums is, uh, um, uh, the sum would be two. The sum of squares uh, should be, I'm sorry. It could, it, there is no way of assigning values um, um, such as the sum would be two. Now, on the other end, the theorem that I showed you showed that assume the continuum hypothesis, then you can do it, almost do it, in the sense that for every x, the, the, uh, uh, you can make the assignment, but for every um, uh, set x, the, the pairs which, which violate, um, I'm sorry, which violate the, the, uh, the equality uh, is countable. They're only countable in many, um, for every fixed x, they're only countable in many counter, counter examples. So it doesn't mean you should start believing in hidden variables or some version of hidden variables in quantum mechanics, but it, it, it tells you, uh, it's an example that what the, the set theoretical assumption could appear in some sense in you try to analyze the physical, uh, uh, the model of the, um, um, the, physical, uh, the physical model. This is a function on the sphere. On yeah. The sphere. yeah. And uh, you can assign for every... You can, assi you can, you can do an assignment of the values Actually, one, uh, um, I misstated it, um, 0, 1, minus 1, so the squares, uh, uh, such that the, the failure of the uh, equality that you expect happens only for every fixed x, it's only for countable many pairs of y, y and z. Any, like, or any like Sorry? Uh, no. No. Okay, that's, uh, that's, of course, a good point. No, I'm, I'm not saying it's a very convincing example, but I said it really touches on the, on the um, on that possibility. Uh, let me give you another example which touches on the possibility of uh, uh, that set theory might be relevant. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, consider a separable Hilbert space. Uh, you consider the, the algebra of bounded operators on H. It definitely represents something that meaningful physically. You talk about the idea of compact operators and the uh, Kalkin algebra uh, is the quantity algebra of the, um, uh, it's a um, sub-algebra if you think about the C-star algebra. And uh, you consider the quotient, uh, consider the quotient algebra. Now consider the problem are, uh, consider automorphism of the Kalkin algebra. You've got inner automorphism, namely uh, that you, uh, you take some um, 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 unitary uh, transformation and you, you apply it and uh, uh, 
So the question is, are there automorphisms of the algebra which are not, do not, which are not inner? This problem is independent, shown by uh, Phillips, Weaver, and uh, Farah. Phillips and Weaver showed one direction, and Farah showed the other direction. Uh, that um, uh, that uh, it's independent of set theory. Now that could be that touches on things which are relevant to physical models. Which, again, not I'm saying that it's got physical meaning, but uh, it potentially can have can, can give you uh, a more nicer or smoother uh, physical theory if you assume one direction rather than um, rather than another. By the way, this is an example where the continuum hypothesis give you give you the the bad example that they are pathological automorphisms which, which are not inner. On the other end, some of the axioms we'll talk about um, in a short while give you that all automorphisms are inner, give you a kind of smoother or nicer direction. So, uh, you know, a very wild, um, uh, very wild shot of the um, thing. Um, okay, are, are we taking a break or? Uh, uh, Let me say what, what's, uh, uh, okay. Hmm? I think I think now it may be maybe a good time for for a short break. Uh, Ten minutes, fine, fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, Noga, we follow your uh, your lead. Uh, so uh, let's try and see what you know. If you search for new axioms, now forget about the speculations and, and let's see what uh, uh, what could be the the kind of axioms we should look for. So one, one uh, and I said that slogan or motivation could be, uh, could be an important aspect of that. So one slogan could be that, uh, Noga, that's exactly in the spirit of what you said, if the continuum policy fails, then there should be a simple definable evidence for the, uh, for the failure. There should be something that really um, uh, you should know. Now what, what is uh, simple definable? A counterexample could be a counterexample to the uh, weak uh, continuum hypothesis, namely a definable set of reals which is neither countable nor the cardinality of the continuum. Namely, you, you define, you describe a set, and you say this set is not countable and not, uh, that's a possibility. And it could be a counterexample to the full continuum hypothesis. It could be um, some simple map. Uh, I phrase the, um, the other continuum hypothesis that whenever you map the reals, whenever you got a map of the reals onto some some ordinal, that ordinal would have to be uh, relatively small. It can't be past LF2. So the, it could be some, some definable map of the reals on the ordinal of cardinality less or equal LF2. Okay, now, now uh, that, that actually uh, gets us into an interesting uh, historical, historical line. Cantor, when he tried to deal with the continuum hypothesis, he really started by something which later became known as the cantor bendixson uh, uh, theorem, which said that if you talk about a closed set of real numbers, uh, it's never a counterexample to the continuum hypothesis. A closed set is either a count, open set is definitely the case. Open set, if it's non empty, then it is size of the continuum, contains an interval. A closed set is either countable or size of the continuum. Really, the closed set, uh, if it's uncountable, then it contains a perfect, uh, a perfect subset. Uh, a perfect subset means uh, no um, um, closed subset, which is uh, no isolated points. Uh, an uncountable Actually, the counter bendixson theorem says a closed, uncountable set contains a perfect subset. A perfect subset means um, uh, closed. Perfect means closed, no uncountable. A no isolated, I'm sorry. Now, the advantage of containing a, a, a perfect subset, perfect subset, uh, you can prove in a very effective way that it's got size of the continuum. It cannot be a smaller size. So, so that means that, um, uh, so uh, Cantor uh, looked at this proof for, uh, as a, a first step in proving the continuum. He was hoping to prove the continuum. He was saying, okay, let's try with simple sets and that hopefully we, we'll get, we'll get uh, to more and more complicated sets. It did not succeed very far, but uh, Hausdorff, uh, Alexandrov independently, uh, showed that every Borel set, Borel set uh, is the collection of sets you get by um, closing the open and the closed sets under countable unions in sections or um, um, complements, is either countable or contains a perfect subset. And Borel set, this is again an example of something which is more effective or you can describe, can never be a counterexample to continuum hypothesis. It's always either countable or contains, or contains a perfect subset. Um, 
Now you can, you can continue from the Borel set to more complicated sets. Losing uh, uh, 1917, every analytic set is either countable or contains a perfect subset. Analytic set is a um, thing that you get by continuous image of a Borel set. Or typically think about that as a projection. It's the same thing. Namely, you've got a Borel set. Here is a Borel set in the plane. You look at a projection. That's what you call analytic. Uh, a set that you can get as a projection of a Borel set in the plane. That's an analy ana analytic set. It doesn't have to be Borel. By the way, it's a famous mistake of Lebesgue that uh, uh, at some point he assumed that projection of a Borel set is a Borel set, and uh, that was wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, but uh, there is something uh, something interesting, which which is that one of the beautiful theorem, if analytic and co-analytic, yeah. then it's Borel, which uh, which you you would love to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, any, anyway, um, so analytic set is either countable or contains a perfect subset. Uh, and then uh, what happens to co-analytic? That that will be the next step. And Gedel, the same universe of Gedel L, uh, shows that there exists an uncountable set, which is a co-analytic, with no perfect subset. Now, if you combine it with coins uh, proof of the, of the investment continuum hypothesis, you can have uh, a co-analytic set, which, which is a counterexample to the continuum hypothesis. It will be of size Aleph 1, where the continuum is, uh, uh, is large. So you can't push this thing uh, in set theory in general. You cannot push it uh, um, uh, too far. OK, is that the end of the story? Uh, well, not, not really. Because uh, for first, uh, let us um, um, introduce the following definition. The class of projective sets is the smallest class containing Borel sets enclosed under continuous images and complementation. So really, what you're talking about is you start from Borel sets. Uh, now I'm uh, introducing the modern uh, terminology, very, very uh, close to the um, uh, notation that you use, I'm sure. That the set is sigma 1, 1 analytic if it's a continuous image of Borel set. We already in, uh, uh, introduced that. It's pi 1, 1 if it's the complement of a sigma 1, 1 set. Uh, in general, the set is sigma 1, n plus 1 if it's a projection or the continuous image of a, uh, a pi set on the previous level, and a pi n plus 1 if it is a complement of sigma uh, n plus 1. And, and projective means that it's uh, at this level, at, uh, at this hierarchy som somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, upper index here, it's a bit because um, uh, um, you can think about it in logical terms. It, it really means that you quantify over, um, um, over real numbers. Zero means you quantify over natural numbers. Uh, uh, one the upper index means you quantify over um, uh, real numbers. There, will be, there, there is two also, which you quantify over sets of real, uh, uh, of real numbers. I, I, I don't, um, don't know about much use. For, for two, the, the, there are some interesting theorems. For three, I don't know any uh, of sets of sets of reals. Uh, I don't know any, any case. Anyway, pi one one set can be a counterexample to 3H. But here the strong x of infinity suddenly kicks in. A theorem of Solovey in a, actually a volume uh, dedicated to, the, I think, the 60th birthday of Gedel. Uh, I got a theorem that says that if there exists a measurable cardinal, then every sigma one two set is either countable or contains a perfect subset. Namely, if you think about the levels of the hierarchy, then uh, uh, and you try to see whether you get a counterexample to the continuum for this. Namely, uh, you talk about Borel, the, uh, like the recursive thing, and the, or the polynomial, and then uh, sigma one one pi one one, and then uh, sigma one two pi one two. So you know that uh, no counterexample to the continuum is a theorem of, of set theory here. But here you could have a counterexample. But if you assume the strong axiom of infinity, the existence of measurable cardinal, suddenly, uh, not just the pi one one, but even this level. Uh, I mean, it's each level of the hierarchy, of course, contains is contained in the next. It's an hierarchy. Uh, it's either countable or contains a perfect uh, subset. And it's got other uh, nice aspects. It's the big measurable and, um, um, and and so on. Uh, but you can't. You can push it one level up. You can't do it. For measurables to, um, uh, for this level. The counterexample of Gedel is being pushed up one level. I mean, the result of losing is pushed up one level. The result of, uh, of Gedel is pushed up one level, but you can't uh, from, from strong, um, um, strong x of infinity. OK, uh, which, by the way, was a fascinating result because here is the existence of some large cardinal up there 
the large cardinal uh, suddenly has got um, an impact on, on sets um, on sets of reals. It's got a, a result uh, about um, um, sets of reals, which was very um, uh, very surprising in a way. Uh, what this axiom says? It's <laughs> oh, you 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 can. Uh, it simply says the following thing. It says that uh, there exist. Um, um, it simply says that the, there exist um, 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 a sigma um, complete. Th there exists a set with a sigma complete measure, uh, non-trivial measure on it, which. Uh, um, 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 I'm cheating a little bit. I'll tell you what it is. Which says that every set is measurable. Nam namely, you. you no, no. There exists a set. Is measurable. Now comes the following, the following dichotomy. Also, due to Solovey, but it, it really doesn't doesn't matter for the purpose of this theorem. But there is there, there is this uh, dichotomy that tells you that either suppose you look for a set and you got a measure on the set, real valued measure, right? on the set which every set is measurable, okay? Now you've got a clear dichotomy. Either um, um, the set has got size, this, the, or the minimal set, either is, is size less than the continuum, and in that case, that measure can be assumed to be measure on the, um, on the reals, such that uh, it extends the Lebesgue measure and makes every set measurable with respect to the measure, that's one dichotomy. So another possibility is that if the continuum is less than that, uh, uh, sigma additive. Sigma additive. Sigma additive. No, finite additive, uh, you always have uh, finite additive. No. Sorry? Not translation. Not translation variant because the, the uh, Vitali um, account, for example, of course, shows that you cannot have a translation variant. But, but if the continuum is less than, than uh, the size of the set, for the minimal set having that, then the measure can be assumed to be really a zero one measure, namely a measure that gets only the value. Um, only the values 0 and 1 can be, be assumed to be a very sim simple as far as the values of the measure. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The results of Solovey applies to both definitions of measurable. If there exists a measurable cardinal, then every sigma onto a set is either countable or contains a perfect subset. Sh Shelach did some papers about this? Uh, no, Sh Shelach has got the following result. Shelach, uh, but by the way, it's, uh, uh, it's an interesting uh, curiosity. Uh, Solovey proved something else. Pro Solovey proved that without the axiom of choice, you can have a model in which all sets are Lebesgue measurable. Uh, uh, very soon after after Cohen, uh, uh, actually using the, the um, that you, you could with, uh, with the axiom of choice, you could uh, in, in, the, in the usual sense in Lebesgue uh, in the Lebesgue sense, you can you can have uh, without the axiom of choice, you can have. Uh, um, um, that all, all sets are the big measurable. You cannot. You, you must need the axiom of choice to produce a non, a non measurable, um, a non, non the big measurable set of reals. So Solovey proved that. The issue is that Solovey used um, uh, for the model. He, he, he needed to use inaccessible, inaccessible cardinal. The consistency of a large cardinal to, to do that. Uh, and the issue was: is that necessary? And what Shalach did was that. Uh, um, that was uh, uh, necessary. Uh, the, cur the cur curious thing, uh, when, um, uh, when he published it, uh, uh, there is another property, which uh, I'm going to talk in a few minutes, which is the bare property, which is a little bit like measurability. Namely, uh, a set of reals is um, um, got the bare property if it's equal to, um, to, to an open set up to a meager set, up to a set which is the union of nowhere dense, nowhere dense set. That's a kind of measure, in a way, uh, of, the, of the set. So the issue is, uh, in Solovey model, every, every set of reals has got the bare property. So the issue is, is are, are those the, the, the same thing? So Shelach initially thought that it's, that's the same, and then you have to retract it. So he published a paper going, which was called Going to Canossa, and uh, which you had to retract the claim, but uh, that was quite going to Canossa, in the same sense, almost like the historical case that uh, when the, the emperor went to, the, to Canossa, and that was actually very, uh, uh, very clever political move, eventually. So <laughs> that, that going to Canossa was also uh, Shela going to Canossa was also very, very shrewd move. But anyway, uh, but, but it's a different uh, it's a different thing. You're, you're now you're talking presence of choice and uh, okay, so you couldn't push it. 
Okay, uh, so uh, uh, the expectation was for a long time that uh, this is, uh, uh, if, you, if you use uh, stronger uh, large cardinals, um, uh, the, the same counterexample could be uh, uh, that there are models that look like uh, the, the model of, of um, uh, Gedel and, uh, uh, and you cannot push it farther. Uh, I was part of a team that, uh, that was able to get from a supercompact cardinal that every sigma on three set is either countable or contains a prefix subset. Namely, you can, from if you take a larger cardinal, then suddenly, uh, uh, even, even at this level, there is no counterexample to the, um, uh, to the continuum hypothesis. The result didn't survive uh, very long because uh, Sherlock and Woodin improved it, that, that uh, every projective set from the same cardinal, uh, every projective set is either countable or contains a perfect subset. And much more applied to, to not just to sets which are uh, projective, but every set which in some sense depends only on the reals. Some set, uh, technically we talk sets that belongs to the minimal model that contains all the reals. All these sets are, can never be a counterexample to the continuum hypothesis. A set like that is either countable or contains, um, um, or contains a perfect subset. Uh, actually, the, the large cardinal was reduced much, by the cardinal that, that be become known as the wooden cardinal. Uh, so the theorem is that there's infinitely many wooden cardinals, which is measurable, then every set in LFR is either countable or cannot be a, a, a counterexample to the um, um, to continuum hypothesis. Actually, something else happens. Uh, that uh, You see the large cardinal has got many other uh, applications for sets which, are, which has got concrete description in a way that belongs to LFR. So one of the results is something called determinacy, which, by the way, implies the big measurability, implies many, many of the results. It shows something about mass. What is, what is determinacy? Determinacy, suppose you consider an infinite, um, infinite game. You've got two players. Player one, player two. And they, uh, suppose they, they pick natural, uh, natural numbers. They pick... Uh, and um, three, and so on. And suppose that before, before the game starts, of course, you, uh, um, you, you pick a certain set, which is a subset of the sequences of natural numbers, and you decide that this is the set of sequences that uh, if that's then the, the result of the game, then player one won. If, if not, then it's player two won. And the issue is, this is a game with perfect information. If the game would be finite, then the famous theorem of von Neumann Morgenstern, again here, um, at the Institute, uh, shows that, that um, um, finite games uh, are always one of the players as a winning strategy. A way of playing guarantee uh, um, success for him. Uh, the, um, the issue is, is it true for infinite games? And for infinite games, you can show that uh, using the axiom of choice, you can, you can have a counterexample where a game which is, not, which is not determined. But the issue comes again. Can you have a simple, is simple games uh, determined? So there was a whole class of results. I don't have the time to go over the, the history. But anyway, uh, it ended up in a result that shows, as a theory of set theory, that every, um, every um, uh, there is a natural topology on this one. Of course, the product, th think about the natural numbers as the discrete topology, think about the product topology. That every Borel set is determined in that sense. One of the players has a winning strategy. Uh, That's the result of Martin following some other results. This, by the way, has got a very philosophically very interesting uh, aspect of that proof. Because this is a proof about sequences of natural numbers or sets of sequences of natural numbers, relatively small. But in some sense, it's got a flavor of, use, it doesn't use any large cardinal in that sense. But the proof uses sets of relatively large cardinality. Uh, and you know, that's a result of Friedman, that you cannot do it without using some relatively large set. Not, not large cardinal necessarily, but roughly for the um, uh, Borel sets of level alpha in the Borel hierarchy, you need uh, uh, to take the power set, the power set of the power set of power set of set alpha, alpha times. And that's necessary. You know that to prove, to prove the determinacy. It's a theorem of set theory, but, but it requires iteration of the power set. And, and that's necessary. That you know that in a set theory where you, where you bound how many times you can apply the power set, you cannot prove it. So um, it's a beautiful theorem, and uh, um, so uh, so it's, it's a kind of uh, reminiscent of the kind of thing we are doing. Here is you use of sets which are relatively large, you use it to prove something about relatively small set, and it's necessary. You can't do it without. Oh, I 
Yeah. 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 And then you need that many uh, uh, operation of the uh, parcel reads. Anyway, the result here shows, under the same assumption, that all the sets in L of R, all the sets that you can describe, are, are determined. It's a kind of uh, very strong case in which all, all the describable sets are, are uh, determined. And that follows them. Uh, for, for, for you, the wooden, uh, assuming the wooden cardinal is, uh, satisfies the list of properties, yeah. you... Yeah, yeah. For instance, one thing is that um, uh, you can have a motivation for that. And in some sense, the motivation comes from the fact that Wooden Cardinal is much weaker than... Uh, uh, super, uh, I don't want to get... Uh, I don't have the time to get the technical definition of supercompact, but you, I think you can have a um, um, uh, slogan or, or um, uh, motivational thing why, why you want to assume the existence of, of supercompact cardinal. Supercompact is much stronger than, than this assumption about the Wooden Cardinals. So th this is the right assumption, in the, uh, the better, but, but uh, as far as the axiom, this is uh, more natural in a way. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, so this is the, the, um, it has got this result. L let me put in a little bit of perspective this uh, re result of Woodin. You're talking about sets which can be described or sets which are nice in a way. Uh, that's, uh, w w what do we have here? That if you assume the stronger axiom of infinity, then a set which is, um, which is relatively nice, a set which is, uh, um, uh, cannot be a counterexample to the continuum hypothesis, it, the relevant set is determined, and, and many other, Lebesgue measurable, and, uh, and so on. I want to put it in a, a, little, bit broader, um, uh, a little bit broader perspective. Uh, so, um, a, a subset of a topological space is said to have the bare property. If it is um, um, equivalent to an open set up to uh, a set of first uh, category, Namely, uh, a set is first category. Um, uh, here is the set. Here is the topological space X. Here is the set A. And if you can find a set U, which uh, an open set, which is almost A, what, what does it mean? Almost the difference, the symmetric difference is meager. Meager means um, uh, countable union of nowhere, nowhere dense set. So if, if it's almost uh, an open set. So that's, that's a relatively nice property of, of sets that uh, um, Okay, so a set of wheels is said to be, uh, now, you could have a set which, uh, which is nice in that sense, but I want to have a, a, li a little bit stronger property. The stronger property is the set of wheels is said to be universally bare. If whenever you take uh, a function from any topological space onto X, and you look at the pre-image of, uh, of A, it has got the bare property. Uh, I'm talking here about the wheels. Um, um, uh, oh, a set of reals, okay. So I'm talking about, that. Uh, let's concentrate on a set of reals. So whenever you take any topological space and you map it continuously to the reals, then the pre-image has got the bare, the bare property. It's a very nice notion of, um, um, uh, very nice notion of a set. Uh, okay. Um, now, um, uh, the theorem is that, that uh, uh, UB universal bare set of must be set of reals. It's a bag measurable as the bare property. This is a theorem of, of set theory. If it's universally bare, then it, 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 it um, um, is the bare property. Um, since there are many. It's trivial, it says the bare property. Uh, is trivial. Uh, these results are not, not necessarily very, uh, very deep or. Uh, uh, even the, the next one is not, is not very, uh, very deep or very new because. Um, um, uh, here you're talking about the following thing. You talk about infinite subset of natural numbers. You talk about the Ramsey version for infinite, infinite sets of natural numbers. Namely, you color, um, um, uh, you color um, infinite sequences of, uh, of natural numbers, and you want to have a set of natural numbers so that every infinite subset of it is in the same, the same color. And uh, so if the coloring is uh, universally bare in a natural sense, then, uh, 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 then you can find, uh, this is a generalization of a result of um, Galvin and Prickery, uh, then there is an homogeneous set. If, if with the axiom of choice, you can, you can prove an, a counterexample, you can get a counterexample, but if the set, if the coloring is universally bare, then, then uh, there, is a, um, um, there, there is an homogeneous set. What, far, uh, what about the properties that we, uh, um, uh, we are talking about? 
If there is a wooden cardinal, then every universally bare set is either countable or contains a perfect subset. It's not, then these universally bare sets are not, um, um, uh, not counterexample to the continuum of bodies. How does that connect with the previous results? It connects with the previous results in the sense that, that uh, uh, let's see, uh, that every, um, um, okay, that uh, actually the, the assumption that Woodin made, did I put it, if there are unbounded many Woodin cardinals, then every set in L of R is universal, universally bare. So, so the, the result of Woodin is, can be, can be uh, factored through the, 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 the statement about universally bare. Actually, uh, if there is even one Woodin cardinal, the universally bare set, that's a result of Itai Neyman, that uh, if um, um, uh, there is even one Woodin cardinal, the universally bare set is um, uh, automatically, um, deter uh, automatically determined in that, in that sense. So universally bare sets are the ultimate nice collection of nice sets, and, and uh, uh, the large cardinals gets you even nicer properties of universally bare, uh, universally bare sets. By the way, universally bare sets has got uh, also another uh, important features for, for us as uh, a set theorist. In some sense, you could almost define them like that. You see, when, when you take a set of reals, and uh, you talk about changing the universe of set theory by forcing, then what is the meaning of the set of reals in the broader, in the broader um, uh, universe? Uh, are you talking about re literally the same, the, se the same set of reals? Probably you don't mean that. Suppose the set of reals has been, you're taking an interval. Uh, there are new reals, new members of the interval. You probably mean the, um, you probably mean the interval in the, in, in the, big the interval in the big universe. If, if the set was Borel, you probably mean the, the interpretation of that Borel set in the bigger, in the bigger universe. Universally bare set has got a very natural way of, uh, of reinterpreting them in a bigger and bigger universe. You got a set, then there is a, a natural way of, um, when you do f forcing extensions, you, you can reinterpret them in the, uh, in the bigger uh, universe, and it's one, one of their uh, features. Uh, and, and, and you keep many of the properties, like a set being equal to another. You got two universally bare sets. This is, you describe in a particular way, this is equal to this one then th their extension are, are equal, one is included in the other. So it's, it's, a, it's a very natural way of, of having a notion of... Uh, uh, uh. So in the presence of wooden cardinals, UB set cannot be counterexample to continuous hypothesis. So uh, without large cardinals, so suppose we forget about large cardinals. What do you know about the cardinality of uh, universally bare sets? Uh, the Gedel, uh, in the uh, generic extension of L, you can have a universally bare set, which is cardinality Aleph 1, and the continuum is large. So we know that the, the values which are possible are either Aleph 0, Aleph 1, or continuum. We, we know that they, these are possible values. Conjecture, um, I've got some reasons for believing in the conjecture. I don't know the proof that that's, uh, even without large cardinal, that's the only uh, possibility. Remember, with the large cardinals, there are only two values, either Aleph 0 or continuum. Now, I said without the large cardinals, there are only, the conjecture is there are only three uh, possibilities. Either Aleph 1, Aleph 0, or Aleph 0 finite, I mean. Or, or, uh, um, um, or continuum. Okay, now, uh, if the conjecture is true, then that's an evidence that, that, um, that probably, if you talk about the size of the continuum, then the continuum could be, if, if, if you want to, to have, um, uh, you know, uh, an effective version of, this, of the size of, you know, if, if the continuum, for, for the size of the continuum, then probably a natural value would be, if at all, suppose you don't want to adopt just the continuum hypothesis, then it could be either Aleph 1 or, or Aleph 2, only possible uh, two values for the, uh, uh, for the continuum. Which one you want to pick, there could be other, um, other consideration. Okay, I want to, uh, I still have some time to uh, exhaust your, your patience, uh, but um, I, I want to, to, um, to, to take another line of, um, uh, I'm presenting several lines of ideas of, of, um, of axioms or considerations that you might adopt in order to decide what would be more natural value for the, for the continuum. So I want to pick another, um, um, another line now. And the line is line uh, which is called uh, forcing axioms, which some of you may know is uh, Martin axiom is an example. We'll talk about it in a minute. 
So the slogan and the motivation is that um, um, as an object that can be imagined to exist, a set that can be imagined to exist, there is no obvious objection to its existence does exist. The universe, uh, the, the universe of sets is, uh, uh, is rich, is um, uh, saturated. It's, 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 it's a little bit like, um, um, again, I'm, I'm uh, going back to an analogy of, uh, um, um, of um, um, uh, algebraically caused field. I mean, you can ima I mean, you got, you got a field, you got the equation. You can definitely imagine, you can extend the field that it has a solution. Then why it shouldn't have a solution? And, uh, so that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that the universe of sets is, um, uh, is rich. Now, it's not that simple. Uh, the issue is how do you formalize uh, what does it mean imagine to exist? What has been an uh, obvious objection to its, uh, to its existence? What, 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 what do you mean by that? OK, so let me, let me be, uh, uh, for a minute, a little bit more, um, more technical. So that's, in some sense, it's a crash course about, uh, about forcing. So suppose you want to, um, uh, to introduce an object of a, certain, of a certain kind. So one way of doing it, what, what you do with forcing, is that you get some kind of, uh, you live in a certain universe, you miss a certain object. You want a new object in the universe. So you talk about approximations to the object. You try to, to get some, uh, I'll give an example in a minute, uh, an approximation to the object. And, and uh, approximations are, um, um, are, uh, are partially ordered by a better, one is a better approximation. So you think about a partially ordered set, uh, par uh, partially ordered set uh, P uh, less or equal. Now, uh, it became the tradition that actually whenever you got Q less or equal P, you mean Q is the better approximation. The smaller, uh, hmm? smaller error or, or less uh, possibilities and so on. By the way, here there is uh, one place in the world where this tradition, uh, uh, initially when Paul coined, it was the other way around. Uh, Jerusalem is the only place where the tradition is the other way, uh, the other way around. Still, we, uh, by the way, I gave up. Uh, Shellach didn't give up, but on the. Um, but uh, in, in, if you read the paper of Shellach, then, then then P gives more information than Q. If that's uh, if that's the case, but uh, uh, I think we have, we have to give up. That's uh, universally accepted. That, that um, the smaller approximation is the one that gives more information. Anyway, uh, so I talk about partially ordered set. Now, what is what does it mean to have? Uh, the object eventually. Object eventually is a consistent, um, consistent um, um, collection of approximations. You define the object you look for if you try to get consistent uh, uh, set of approximations. So a G, a subset of P, is a filter. That's a notion of the consistent. If it has the following, the following uh, conditions, if P belongs to G, and um, uh, Q is above P, that implies the Q in G. Namely, if, if you decide on approximation P, and here is a bigger, um, so, so, so something which is um, um, uh, bigger, namely gives me less information, it's definitely a good approximation. It's a set of good approximations. Upward close sets. Uh, uh, upward close sets. That's one thing. Another thing is compatibility. If P and Q belongs to G, then there exists R in G such that R is below both P and Q. Maybe P and Q are incomparable, but, but there exists something uh, in the filter which, uh, which uh, agrees both of them. We said in that case that P and Q are compatible. There exists something that agrees with below both of them. OK, so that's, uh, um, uh, the, um, that's, uh, that's a filter. Now, uh, uh, you, you would like the, the object to, to, um, to satisfy some some requirements. It has to be you, wa you want to introduce an object with a certain uh, with a certain property. So uh, so you say that D. Suppose you got a D which is a subset of um, uh, of P. Then uh, D is called dense if D is downward closed, dense open to be formally. Uh, Closed, and for every p in p, there exists q less or equal than p, so the q belongs to d. Namely, it's a set that you cannot avoid. 
it's, it's a, a set of things that, that whenever you got an approximation, there's still a chance of, of eating Dean. Still, you, you can still extend the approximation to something that, that will be in, uh, in the set D. Downward, namely, if you're, if you're already in D, then that's it. Then any, anything smaller is in D. It, it's like satisfying a requirement. So you've got an approximation which satisfies the requirement. I'll give an example in a minute. For every, P in uh, for every P in the partially ordered set, there exists something in D which is below it. Namely, the, you can still improve P to approximation which satisfies the requirement. But it's enough to do it. Sorry? No, no, and, and, and the, the requirement about G, that it, it intersects uh, uh, that some dense sets, or some collection of, the, of dense sets. Let, 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 let me give you an example. Suppose that uh, maybe uh, keen to, to think you, you would like to do. Uh, suppose you've got a collection of uh, functions from, suppose that F uh, is a collection, uh, is some collection is a set of functions from um, um, functions n from, from uh, natural numbers from natural numbers. You would like to find, suppose you want to find a function that, that uh, grows faster than all these functions, something that majorizes all these functions. Majorize means eventually majorize. What could be an approximation to something like that? The set P would be you say, OK. We, we want uh, some, some, some function g that from n to n, so that for every f in f, um, for every f in f, eventually um, there exists an m such that for every k bigger than m, g of k is above f of k. You want something that measurizes eventually every function. What would be an approximation to something like that? Approximation to something like that would be uh, um, a finite information about the function f, about the function uh, g, I'm sorry. So it would be a finite ap uh, uh, approximation of g. And uh, so p will be made up of pairs of a finite approximation. So it will be some g star um, and, um, and f star, f star, such that uh, g star is a finite function. from n to n, I mean a partial function from n to n, but finite. You, you give finite information. f star is a finite subset, is a subset of f finite. Namely, uh, and intuitively what you mean is that this is the commitment you already made about the function g that you are trying to, to build. And the finite set means that from now on, may, maybe whatever you've done, you've done, but from now on, you're going to, any, any function that's mentioned in f star, you're going to be above, above those functions. Yeah. Can I try to paraphrase it in a way that might be more accessible to computer scientists? Okay. So you're doing a diagonalization argument. You have a, you're trying to construct an object that meets certain conditions. And you want to be able to say, oh, well, I can make sure that the function has condition one. And then once it has condition one, I can make sure it has condition two and yeah. so on. So what property do you need these First, once you, so the, the downward closure means once you achieve that condition, then you are done. Further extension is going to maintain that condition. Then the other thing is no matter what decisions I made in the past, it's always possible to achieve the next condition. I think perfect, perfect description of what, uh, ex except that here, not necessarily, I and mean, um, uh, probably we have to meet more than uh, uh, countably many. Re requirements. That's that's uh, that's the issue. But it's ba ba bas basically exactly that. So the requirement is for every for every function f in f. Uh, so we, we consider d f to be the set of pairs g star uh, f star, such that of course g star f star belongs to p, and uh, the function f is already mentioned in f star. Namely, you are committing yourself at, uh, at some point that you are. Uh, you already commit yourself to be above, above the function f. Now, if you got a g, a filter g, which is a subset of p, a subset of p, which is which, such that g intersect df is non-empty for every f 
in, um, in, in F star that essentially give you a function which is, uh, dominates all this, um, all this function. So that's, uh, that's a way of satisfying uh, the thing. Okay, so, so now, uh, uh, so this is the object. So imagine to exist something you can get by this, uh, by this process. Okay, so uh, uh, partially ordered set, uh, a forcing axiom. So now the, the forcing axiom is that you go to partially ordered set. You got a cardinal, a fixed cardinal. The forcing axiom for, uh, uh, forcing axiom lambda for, for the partially ordered set P is the statement whenever you got lambda many dense subsets, dense in this sense, subset of P, then you could, you, you, uh, you could meet it. You can find a filter that you can satisfy the requirement of the, you got a set of approximation, then you, you can meet lambda many things. Trivially, by exactly what you said, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, Russell. Russell. But Russell said that if uh, um, a lambda is countable, then it's trivial to, to satisfy it. The first axiom is true for every, for every P, for, for lambda, lambda countable. If P is a class of partially ordered set, then uh, it's, it's a statement for everything in the class. For every P, the, if, uh, the forcing axiom for all of zero is always true. But uh, on the other end, for many uh, simple P, very simple P, even our example, if you try to meet uh, continuum many uh, requirements, then uh, it's simply false, you can't meet. For instance, take this example. Try to meet, I'm not, I'm not extending the universe of set theory. Suppose that F, F star is made up of all functions from N to N. You can't, you can't find a function that dominates every function. So, so you cannot meet um, to the of zero many, you cannot meet continuum. So the interesting case is for L of zero, this forcing axiom is trivial. For two of zero, even for very simple thing, it simply cannot, no, no chance of having it. So the interesting case would be that uh, lambda equal aleph one when aleph one is less than, than two to aleph zero. But even in this case, there are uh, obvious obstacles to having this, um, um, uh, this forcing axiom. There are some obvious uh, obstacles for having the uh, forcing axiom even for, uh, even if the continuum is large and, uh, um, so a way of trying to uh, overcome it come exactly by uh, Martin axiom, which uh, uh, you say that a partially ordered set satisfies the countable chain condition if every subset of mutually incompatible elements is countable. If you take a set of mutually incompatible, then only countable many things are, um, are satisfied. Martin axiom is the statement that this is true for every value less than the, con the, less than the continuum, which is trivially true if, if uh, uh, continuum is aleph one, because you, here you're talking about only about countable, but it's interesting if the continuum is, is larger. Now Martin axiom decides many, many different uh, statements. The white conjecture I mentioned before. The, the, white, the Martin axiom plus continuum is false. Decides many statements. It doesn't decide the value of the continuum. There is almost the same freedom, almost, the same freedom we have uh, initially everything is consistent with a Martin axiom. So as far as deciding the problem we, we want to talk about, it's not, uh, you cannot, you cannot uh, decide it. So the Martin axiom is really about the power of the forcing method. Yeah, Interesting. yeah, but, but it, it's a way of avoiding, the limitation of CCC is trying to avoid the, 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 the obstacles that for some people could, um, um, could be satisfied. Okay, but is that the best, the best you can do? So uh, Tov, uh, here is uh, Ma Ma Martin Solovey, they proved Martin axiom is consistent with the value, it consists in many different values of the continuum, as I said before. Now, uh, um, uh, but is the CCC, is that the, the, um, the only uh, obstacle um, uh, bearing uh, uh, mechanism you can have? It turns out that it's not. There is a technical thing, which I don't have the time to, to which is called stationary preserving. That if, uh, if P does not satisfy this technical condition, then automatically it, uh, it, must, it must fail. Then, then you cannot meet, then you can have alpha one many dense sets uh, that you cannot, uh, you cannot meet. So there is something which, which um, 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 prevents you from for aiming for, for this class. But now suppose that this technical condition is, is, is satisfied. So if it's not satisfied, then no chance. Suppose it, it is satisfied. It is satisfied then uh, uh, that there is um, uh, an axiom called Martin maximum, which is the statement that this is old for every P which to satisfy this condition and for every lambda which is less than, uh, uh, less than continuum. So it's a kind of maximal version of Martin axiom that you could have because you can't, you, you can't have it for any P which 
you can't have it for every p which do, does not satisfy uh, sp, and, but the, the axiom says that you can have it for, for sp. The result is that it is consistent uh, with the failure of ch. Ch it, it, it's trivial, assuming the consistency of some large cardinal. But here comes the surprise when we uh, finger. It implies that the continuum is either aleph 1 or aleph 2. Namely, uh, you cannot, whereas Martin axiom, you could have the continuum as large as you want. Uh, there are some limitations which are not um, uh, Martin axiom here. Uh, it has got many, many con other consequences, but uh, it implies that uh, the continuum is either aleph 1 or aleph 2. Aleph 1, the axiom is trivial because you're talking about meeting less than continuum, meeting aleph, aleph 0, but you can have it with continuum aleph 2, and uh, uh, you can. And more interesting, that uh, further results of uh, uh, Sevot Dolcevich, Veliskovich, um, uh, so that any, uh, there, there were several attempts to, to start with Martin axiom and to extend it a little bit. So anything that you try to, to extend it, Martin axiom consists of many different values of the continuum. Suddenly you are getting stuck with the value of the uh, continuum cannot be bigger than uh, uh, aleph 2. There is some kind of obstacle to the continuum uh, uh, being aleph 2. Uh, let me just say that, that um, um, there are other lines which I, I don't have the time to, to elaborate, which indicates that aleph 2 is a kind of natural, na natural all kinds of construction that can work up to aleph 2 but then get, um, uh, get stuck. So the, uh, uh, the, the final thing is that uh, there may be axioms which in some sense or some values of the continuum are some possibilities of the continuum problem are more, more equal than others. Namely, not, not, not all of them are, are the same. So, so some of them are fits together with some, some kind of slogan, some kind of motivation, some kind of, of uh, structure of set theory which are in some sense uh, better or more desirable than other, uh, uh, other values. So the thing is not completely, it's not completely uh, wild jungle. Uh, some values are uh, more possible than others. Which one or what would be the philosophical motivation and what that's uh, actually the subject of another, uh, could be the subject of another talk and well, I'm not sure that I've, I've uh, uh, very good answers to the, uh, uh, to the values. But, but um, I think that this line of work of in which you try to find axioms which do have some intuitive motivation, which you have some, uh, m m maybe you, you don't have the full argument why they should be true, but definitely why it would be um, practical or useful to adopt them, at least as, as uh, um, one possibility out of small number of possibilities. I think that there is a very good chance of developing uh, a small collection of axiom systems, extension of set theory, which uh, um, which settles many of the uh, independent problems. Okay, thank you.